So I'm going to just give you a minute. If anybody's joining us now, um, we're recording the session and we'll share this on the Chagas website later. So I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Claire Sampson from Russell IPM. She's joining us from North Wales today. Um, so we can, uh, we're near neighbours. Claire has been to Ireland previously and has visited some growers. Uh, so she knows our setup quite well. Uh, Eamon Kehoe was joining us as well as soft fruit advisor down in sunny southeast. I'm sure it is sunny down there today. Um, and today we're going to look at um, thrips. So there's kind of a, a bit of a spectrum on their impacts on crops from total destruction to um, passable and no economic injury. So I will pass over to Claire. I'm delighted that she's been able to join us today. And it kind of sets off a couple of webinars we're going to be holding over the next uh, three weeks or so. Um, the, the group joining us today, there's, there's quite a varied background from pot plants, bedding plants, soft fruit, and um, we've a good few students as well, so a special welcome to them. So Claire, I'm going to hand over to you, and um, thanks again. Thank you very much, Donald. Um, so my name's Claire Sampson, I'm from Russell IPM, and we're based in North Wales. A uh, small bit about myself is I actually did a PhD on thrips um, and I've worked for biological pest control companies in the past and done a lot of research in thrips. So, uh, yeah. so they're dear to my heart, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so Russell IPM, we produce traps and pheromones and uh, biosolutions uh, other than chemical pesticides. I'm going to concentrate mainly on western flower thrips because that's the main pest species that a lot of us have in the crops. So as you know they're from the order Thysanoptera, they're very very tiny and this is one of the problems is that they can, they, they have this hiding behaviour, they like to hide behind petals and under leaves and they're difficult to spot and yet they can build up very rapidly in the crops. So the life cycle at 25 degrees centigrade is only 13 days, so you can see that they can breed very rapidly. They lay their eggs in the plant, so it could be in the leaf or the petals, various places. And we've got two wingless larval stages um, during the feeding, and then we've got two pupil stages, so they typically drop to the floor um, to pupate. And then I've got, um, sorry, my daughter's just having her breakfast. <laughs> Erin, could you just be quiet, please? Do apologise for that. <laughs> yeah, so we've got adult wing stages, the males and females, and they have this uh, behaviour where they aggregate together on very um, prominent coloured surfaces. So the, the, the males produce an aggregation pheromone and both males and females are attracted to that. And their biology is very specific. It's called haplodiploidy. And this is where mated females will lay eggs, lay, produce both male and female young. But if a female's not mated, she will produce male offspring. So she can, one female is enough to start a new population. Um, and this has led to them being able to develop resistance very quickly because if you've got an adult female that's resistant to pesticides, she can produce a, a whole new generation of males and females that uh, are resistant to pesticides. So we've got a lot of behavioural and biological reasons why thrips are very, very adaptable and established in a wide range of crops. And so lastly, they have over 250 host plants. So if they spread to a new area, and they do that through mainly through trade, they can establish very, very quickly as long as they've got uh, the right temperature conditions because they can breed on practically everything. So with pesticides not working hugely well and a high level of insecticide resistance, um, we rely on the main control method actually with biological control. And the species that are used commercially, we've got predatory mites, and there actually are a number of species, but the one that you probably know most, uh, mostly are Neosulus cucumis, that works in our sort of European temperatures. 
And it's predatory mite, but it only eats first in star larvae. So because of that, you need to inundate the crop with the mites uh, to stop them feeding on the, on, to, to, to stop the population developing by feeding on the first instars. Um, and because they can't control the adults, so it relies on preventative inundative releases, so that you keep releasing them. They will feed on pollen, so for crops with pollen, you can actually establish and you get an establishment uh, population on the plants, but without pollen, you need to keep putting them in regularly. Uh, there's another predator, which is a fantastic predator called Aureus, and again, there are several species, but typically we would use Aureus levigatus. Um, and it's a voracious predatory bug, and it feeds on a number of different pest species. But again, it needs food to stay in the crop, otherwise it'll fly off. And it also has got some temperature thresholds below which you, you won't get very good establishment below 15. So it's, it's not a, a winter, it's something you can establish easily in the winter or in unheated crops. So both of these predatory types, you know, they've got their drawbacks. So we need to increase their reliability. And this is where traps come in. So it's the opportunity for trapping. So we use tra trapping for monitoring. Yes, they're a good, very good way of picking up very low numbers of, of thrips. And it's particularly useful early in the season to see whether you've got thrips about. Um, but also for decision making, you know, have you got so many thrips that you need to make an intervention? But we found that we can catch so many thrips on traps that you can actually use mass trapping. So you catch enough thrips to bring the adult population down in the crop and then reduce the damage. And then we've also been at Russell IPM, we've been looking at these push pull strategies so that we've actually got general repellents, which are repelling the pest away from the crop as well as the traps which are trapped into the trap and these are improving it even further. So when we're looking, considering traps, we've got a number of things to consider. So firstly is what size of trap? Well, yeah, the more traps you've got, the more thrips you catch, but of course if there are economic and, uh, and uh, blocking the light issues, so you, you can't have too many traps. But the color is very important, so you want to choose the most uh, attractive trap colour for your specific species, which I'll come on to in a minute. The position is also important. So for Western flower thrips, because they have this aggregation pheromone, um, they are specifically uh, looking for a prominent place to, to, to aggregate. And so it's got to be visible to the thrips. So typically you'd have it slightly above the flowers, so it's visible to the thrips, but not too far because they're not, you know, they've got very delicate little wings and uh, you know they're not hugely brilliant flyers they mostly get blown by the wind so not too far above the plant but above it so they could be seen you've got some people that say that the shape affects the catch i think that's debatable um but the amount you catch will depend on the species of thrips but also the number of flowers because flowers are competing with traps for for attention you know they're they're again they're nice bright colors and they <laughs> pollen and they're um, you know they're, they're they're competitive with the traps themselves we've got a very highly flowering crop you might catch relatively few on the traps temperature is also important you get more thrips flight in warmer weather and you so that you get more uh, because of a higher temperature not necessarily because of a higher pest population so as understanding all of these issues will affect what you're trapping there so Western flower thrips we know is very strongly attracted to these sort of medium colored uh, blue color traps, um, very specific trap color um, and compared to the white or the yellow. But the reason I put in a, a, a chart there of the glass house white uh, fly trap catch is because white flies are very strongly attracted to yellow but not the other trap colors. So this is a trap catch on different trap colors. Um, and so if you want to monitor both white fly and thrips, you might choose yellow because you catch both on one trap. But if you want to catch the most, you would choose blue for western fly thrips and yellow for white fly. So there are ways of increasing the trap catch further. So we've done some uh, experiments. We've got a product with white patterns on a blue roller trap, and this is 
we found in trials in different crops in different countries has increased the thrips trap catch about by about 25 percent and not only western flower thrips but also uh, thrips major as well another way to increase the trap catch is to use pheromones so western flower thrips got a species specific pheromone so that's the aggregation pheromone, but it, it own, only Western flower thrips responds to it. But it is approximately doubling the trap catch. So in the chart there, the control is a trap without the pheromone. And when you add the pheromone, you're doubling the trap catch. You can use that both on the sticky board traps for monitoring, but also we've got a product where we've incorporated it onto the roller trap to increase the trap catch for the roller trap as well. But there might be use for a chiromone lure. So a chiromone is, is a scent from one species that attracts another species. So in this case, we've, there are some chiromones which are based on the scent from flowers. So these are more generally attracted to a range of thrips that might inhabit in flowers. So for example, um, Western flower thrips, onion thrips, rose thrips, they're all attracted to flowers. Because Western flower thrips is people are getting better at controlling it with their biological pro programs, actually some of these other thrips are becoming more of a problem. So something like rose thrips, to be honest, we don't even know how to the extent to which they're breeding on strawberry plants, for example, because you get far fewer larvae. So it might be that you're getting adults coming in, doing a lot of damage and moving on, but they're not controlled because the predatory mites are not feeding on the larvae because the larvae are not there. We're also getting some, for the ornamental guys amongst you, we're getting some more invading pests like the thrips cytosis, Japanese flower thrips. So again, this is found particularly on cyclamen and in patians. Um, and we're looking into what, well, we know that we can see them on yellow and blue traps. We don't know which is the most attractive. But they're more sedentary thrips. So we're doing trials at the moment to see how effective the um, mass trapping is for these species that are not quite so mobile as Western flower thrips. And then Vanda thrips is found on Thalanopsis. So again, these are new species coming in that we've got to watch out for and, and see how we can trap them. But the chiromone laws, because we don't have the, West, the aggregation pheromone for these other species, the chiromone law is more generally attractive to a range of thrip species. So uh, the chiromone law that uh, we've developed at Russell IPM is called Thripnog. Again, this contains two floral scents and it attracts species like Western flower thrips and thrips to bassi. You can attach it to your roller traps or your sticky boards and you're getting about an increase in a, a every a three times increase in trap catch and putting them out every 10 meters and they give in cooler conditions they give a stain, sustained release over several weeks or even months so in the winter is outside it's what lasting three months so in trials in the uk so this was strawberry so um, actually we did two trials recently one in polytunnel one in gla heated glass house both gave very similar results so the control in this case is a trap without any scent and then this adding the pheromone this was the aggregation pheromone gave an increase of 1.5 and then both lurum and thripnox so lurum is a, another chiromone chiromone attractant from copper so both the copper product and Thripnot gave an increase of about three times by adding them to the traps. So they're quite useful for, where, for crops where you've got a range of thrip species. And you can see from this where you've got the right kind of trap and you've got an attractant added, you really catch an awful lot of thrips. So then the next question is, is the catch, are you catching enough to reduce numbers in the crop? That's mass trapping which um, you're not really supposed to say because I think if you if you claim mass trapping then products have to be registered as a pesticide um, so typically we're calling this precision monitoring um, but yeah that's what I say yeah uh, so I should 
So it, we've done huge numbers of field trials in various crops from 2012 to 2020. Um, and we're finding actually that mass trappings reduce thrips numbers per flower by between 50 and 78 percent and crop damage by 29 to 88 percent. So we're getting a, a massive reduction in thrips numbers per flower. And but you always even with those numbers, that's not enough. So, you, you know, you, if you've got 88 percent reduction in thrips numbers, um, if you're still left with damaging numbers, it's, it's not enough. So you, you have to combine them with pressures and integrated pest management program. Um, we've seen the basis, the greatest reduction when you've got higher thrips numbers, because sometimes if you've got uh, ornamental plants where the damage threshold is very, very low, and you've got very, very low numbers of thrips, it's hard to show that in a, in a big percentage reduction. Um, but it's still very, very important because you're keeping the numbers down. It's much easier to manage a lower population, population of thrips and keep it low rather than having to bring down a higher population of adults. Uh, this is a field trial results from a strawberry plant. Uh, so here again, we had this was you know, fully replicated, four replicates, big plots. Traps were put up in July and we had three treatments. One was controls without any traps. Um, then traps is just with the pheromone traps down the leg rows of the strawberry. Oh, sorry, traps alone with leg traps down the leg rows of the strawberry and then traps with the pheromones in the added aggregation pheromone. And you can see that by August, both plot, both treatments with the traps were maintaining the thrips levels. You know, the, the, the thrips numbers weren't increasing. But in the control plots without any traps, they'd start to increase. By September, the, in the control plots, even though with the predatory mites were there, the numbers of thrips had gone beyond the damage, above the damage threshold, and you're getting strawberry bronzing in the strawberry fruit. Both the traps and the traps of the pheromones had maintained the thrips numbers below the damage threshold. So thrips were still there, and you see that they had increased slightly, but not enough to cause economic damage. And the return to the grow was at more than uh, two thousand pounds per per acre, I think it was. So um, you know he got an e economic benefit from using them, even when you take into account all labour of putting up the traps. Um, yeah, and the cost of the traps themselves. And very importantly, because everybody's using biocontrol and they're using bumblebee pollination, then the traps work very well with that. We, we had saw no impact on the biocontrol establishment or the, the pollination with the bees. Uh, so finally, I was going to talk about the push-pull strategy that we're looking at. So again, we're adding another element to the program to further improve it. So this is uh, Magipal. So it's a general insect uh, pest repellent, but it also attracts natural enemies. So again, it's a natural product that's produced by plants when they're attacked by a lot of pests. And natural enemies use that product to come in and, and um, to find their pests, the pests to feed on. But also because pests don't want to feed on heavily attacked plants, they avoid it, so that's a, a, a repellent as well. So when you combine this natural enemy repel, uh, attractant, general repellent with the traps and pheromones, you see it has the effect of driving away from the pests away from the crop and catching more on the, on the rolls. And um, using this push-pull strategy, again, <coughs> some results, is a control without any traps or magipal, the oranges with Magipal, the op Optirol is the traps, and the push pull is with both Magipal and the traps. You can see that you've got the lowest thrips numbers with the push pull strategy, uh, with up to 95% in some crops reduction in pest numbers, uh, in thrips numbers. Um, so that's a strategy we're looking at for various different pests, actually, because it's a repellent for other pests, including spotted wind drosophila and capsids. Uh, so that's kind of uh, watch this space. And we managed to put, so AHDB are 
investigating that this year as well. So there'll be results in the public domain through AHDB on push-pull strategy. So a quick summary before some questions. Very important to start clean. Uh, and that's where your monitoring comes in and preventing preventative programs. So you have to start putting your biological control and get your trappings up from the start. Um, it, these are preventative treatments. If you stop yourself getting a problem, then you otherwise you're always chasing it. Select the best trap color and put it in the right place so it's visible to the thrips, but not too far away from the plant so that they don't fly up to it. You can increase that trapping with different types of attractants. So you've got the Western flower thrips aggregation pheromone that's specifically for Western flower thrips. And then you've got that chiromones such as thripnock and lurum, which both attract several species of flower of thrips that typically live in flowers. If you trap from first flowering, it reduces crop damage. So if you combine these traps and those with Magipal and, and natural enemies for the push-pull strategy, that improves your control. And there will be a place for pesticide, chemical pesticides, insecticides, um, if you <coughs> damage thresholds. Um, you know, it's useful as a part of a compatible bit of an IPN program, but always use compatible treatments. So typically we our growers would use spinosad. It can be used to integrate quite well, but there are resistance if you keep you know, resistance levels are high if you use it repeatedly every season. So if you can use all these other methods of control and then go and with spinosad only when you need it, you've then got a much more sustainable control. Um, but you do these treatments based on your monitoring results. So I think that's a quick whistle stop tour and all I've got to say for, for that. Um, thank you very much for listening. And any questions? Claire, that's fantastic. Thanks very much. You've a round of applause there from Eamon. Uh, that's a really interesting. That's a, an exciting one to finish on the, the magic pal or the magic pal. Uh, to kind of repel and attract, so really finishes complements the the push pull strategy. You know, in the monocrop like strawberries, it works. It looks exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, I want. I, I probably I didn't want to go on too long about it, but um, we've got a blister pack formulation for Magipal, and and I'd say that you know that has a repellent effect, but it's sort of like more reduces pests by thirty forty percent, which is not hugely, you know, if you're a grower and you put it out on its own, you're not hugely impressed by that. And we were developing a spray formulation, which is actually more like 80% reduction. But, um, but what we found is when you're looking at these properly replicated plots, you know, you see a big difference. And because it's repelling a range of pests, it's worth having for that, you know, because it's, it's not just thrips, it's thrips. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're seeing an increase in the trap cash, which, you know, demonstrates it's because it's pushing them onto the traps. Yeah, uh, it sounds, sounds great. So if um, this time of the year, you know, what does monitoring look like to you? You know, is it individual blue and yellow sticky traps? Is it roller traps for mass trapping? Um, you know, or do you just assume it's coming and uh, you start putting the program in? So, um, I mean, Eamon, Eamon will be able to, to add something here, but for, for, um, for UK growers, for strawberry growers, obviously it's different in different crops. So for strawberry growers, uh, the, the typically they will need to put their roller traps out from first flowering. If you've got Western flower thrips, every year you, you don't mess about <laughs> you well i mean for glasshouse guys you know right from planting you put put your your roller traps up and get your predators in so typically in the uk grow we put in the predators in every two weeks uh, the predatory mites um if you've got a history if you're an ornamental grower and you've got a history with very low thrips numbers but you just want to see what's going on then you might have a pattern of monitoring using these red and, uh, excuse me, uh, blue and yellow board monitoring traps. 
you know, and maybe one every 200 meters squared just to look, but you can't get around from not looking at the crop as well. So you, you have to look at the plants as well for dimension. And in terms of the mass trapping, though your, your sticky traps, they're up season long. They're not replaced. As long as they're sticky, they, they're, they're in use. That's right, yeah. Okay. There, there's Donald, a few questions can, coming can I there. Ask a I'll question, let Donald. You there? Aim and work away, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Quick question. Um, Claire, you know the difference in like some strawberry varieties are really super susceptible to the trip damage. Do you have any idea what it is about the, the plant or the varieties that make them more susceptible? Is it the pollen or something like that in the in the flower that do you have any idea? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, it's not really something that I've gone into. Uh, yeah, I'm racking my brain because I did some trials on this and there was, there was one variety that was particularly susceptible that's no longer growing and it, it just had so many flowers all at one time. Right. It, it's a massive attraction for thrips to come in. Um, oh, was it finesse? That, that was one, I think. Oh, finesse, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was massively attractive. You yeah. know, I'm, uh, so I'm guessing that's part of it, isn't it? Lots of flowers all at yeah. once. With a yeah, yeah. Very attractive um, fragrance. What do you have a? I'll throw it back at yourself. What varieties have you seen that's? Well, El Santo was ridiculously susceptible. It's Malin Centenary doesn't seem to be as as susceptible. It varies from the varieties. Yeah. So you learn this by mistake or experience. You know. Um, Something else I wanted to ask you about the um, the trip knock, the lure. Does that need to be? You don't put a lure onto each trap, do you? How many how many lures do you kind of need? Yeah, so we're sort of recommending like one every you know ten meter spacing. Okay. That type of thing. If you want to treat the whole crop, but if you've only got a few traps, you know, then you would put one with every trap. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's great. Okay. Thanks very much. Great. Um, we'll have a look at some of the, the questions that have come in there. Um, and um, the first one was, um, how does this tie in with cultural control? So I guess in terms of managing temperature, humidity. Um, yeah, so I didn't talk much about cultural control, but, um, but of course it's every bit as important as, as everything else as a, you know, it's like the bedrock of IPM, isn't it? Start with good cultural control and, uh, you know, even starting to begin with, with the crops coming into the nursery, so important to inspect what's coming in and so that you don't start with a big thrips population. Um, I mean, mostly for temperature and humidity, you know, you, a bit limited because mostly you're you're growing you're using the best conditions for growing your crop. Yeah. That's often the best for thrips as well. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a trade off. You you want your crops to grow all right. Um, you have anything yourselves to to comment on that, Don or you? Really? No, I I think you're kind of you're in a, a delicate position that you want to keep the crops growing as fast as they can and, and keep your turnover as quick as you can. So um, there isn't going to be a huge amount that you could do in terms of dropping temperatures to reduce the speed of uh, reproduction. So it's not, um, that's not an easy area to play with. Um, but with the ornamentals, I think you've probably got some more flexibility with um, plant protection products. Um, but certainly the edibles would be more delicate or, or need better monitoring in terms of um, harvest intervals. So I know that, but uh, culturally, um, no, maybe green, green compost toppings might have an impact, but uh, I haven't seen any, any data on that. Uh, so we've uh, another question there. Could chiromone traps also attract natural predators? Yeah, so I think that's a, a good question. Um, there's been quite a lot of uh, research on uh, lurum, the, the copper product, um, and there's some indication in, in, I think there's one species of aureus that is attracted to it, but uh, not possibly to the effect, 
to the amount that affects establishment in the crop. So I think that the aureus, you know, they tend to prefer, you know, they're, they're really looking for pests. And so although they feed on pollen, and you can get some of the traps, I'm not denying that, uh, but when I've looked at it, not enough to actually affect establishment in the crop. Thripnock is a very new product, so we don't know fully. It's the one that we're, we're testing at the moment. I imagine it's similar to lurum. Obviously, they're not attracting the predatory mites as such. Okay, okay. That's perfect, thanks. Um, a question about um, outdoor crops of uh, laurel. So ha, um, I have a problem with yellow thrips, uh, thrips flavus on outdoor laurel grown for foliage causing major damage on the leaves. Would mass trapping work outdoors? Does Magipal work outdoors? Okay, so uh, I don't have any experience with the thrips flavus. And so uh, mass trapping, we, I mean, people do use the traps outside, so you can use them outside. Uh, when it's cooler, the thrips aren't flying as much. So this question of, you know, are you get, do you catch, uh, unless you put them out there, I don't, I don't think you'd know really, you'd have to test that. And magic power, does it work outside? Um, again, yeah, you, it'll have some effect. So it'd be possibly worth trying, but I, I honestly don't know because we've not tested it. Okay, so what it's, it sounds like it's worth a look, but unsure so far how it'll work out. Um, thanks, Claire. Um, questions are, how did the bees get caught on the traps? I didn't catch what Claire said, so that's just for a comment from someone. Yeah, so uh, actually I think, uh, so for the, um, for pollination, uh, I think what I was saying is that the roller traps have no effect on on the pollination. So we we didn't catch enough bees to affect any pollination. Uh, I think you can catch, you know, occasional ones. I think you'd catch more on the dry glue sticky board traps. You can catch bees on those. But I haven't seen, I don't think I've seen hardly any bees on those roller traps. Yeah, it seems to be kind of par for the course with the sticky traps that you're you're going to have some other things getting caught up accidentally on them. But I guess yeah. the, the numbers are usually pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Claire, uh, there's a question there. Are there any links with mineral deficiencies and attractiveness to pests? Oh, you're you're um, testing my. Oh. I believe there are some <coughs> some situations where pests will exploit poorer crops, you know, poor patches of, of, of crops, but um, <coughs> I can't remember. <laughs> I, I presume yeah. there's some level of uh, their defense mechanisms don't work as well and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. they can't respond to attacks by insects then. But I would think in yeah, in in those situations, you you need to sort out your mineral deficiency to grow your plant anyway, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wouldn't lead like to modern mo modern nature will detect a weak plant like a weak person. You know, she'll um, she the pests will detect a weakness and he'll exploit it. So you're spot on. Okay, Grant. Okay, that's a that's a good raffle. We have a few more questions coming in though. Um. Do, do, do. Oh, let's see how oh, some of them might be done. Let's get rid of that. Or maybe. Um, how, sorry, I'm just trying to read them here. Um, is there a risk that using an attractant will help make the crop more attractive for thrips to come into the crop from external sources? Yeah, so th these uh, lures are not, they're not attracting pests from huge areas, to be honest. Uh, you know, so we're saying 10 metres, and that's about as far as it's, it's reaching, to be honest. Um, 
And in most situations where you've got a crop surrounded by vegetation that's not attractive, you've already brought them in anyway. So it's more about just controlling them within. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. Um, question about the, the patterned uh, roller traps. Are thrips attracted to patterns on the sticky traps uh, and strips? Yeah, so the, we found that they were, by adding the white pattern on the blue, increased the trap catch. Um, but when we added a black trap pattern on yellow, it didn't. So it's probably not to do with the pattern as such. Well, it depends what colour it is, really. It's got to be in another attractive colour to the thrips. So, but it does, it, it works to some degree with the, the thrips. Yeah, but, but yeah. only with the white on blue, not with the black on yellow. Yeah, okay. Uh, another kind of interesting question I have relating to, uh, we'll say, indoor plants or office plants. So how relevant is this strategy in indoor large landscape plantings? So maybe on a green wall or something like that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking, is, is this for mass? I'm, I'm not sure whether this is for uh, like display and uh, whatever, or uh, actually commercial growing those. I no, think it, it would be for long-term land, interior landscaping. So, you know, in a, an office block or, or something like that. Yeah. Would have, uh... So I guess my question is there, if, you know, probably are they gonna want to see plastic? <laughs> <laughs> so i mean it would work but would they want it <laughs> well maybe a camouflage pattern would be the next one to try <laughs> uh, yeah. attractive color yeah i know i know from working in many moons ago looking at indoor and office plants that so you you might find spaces that were hidden from public view that that would still be have plants growing you know so maybe on a well landscaped site um but in theory, they, they still work inside, um, even if, you know, on a different crop. Yeah, I mean, as long as, it, yeah, it's like most of this is used in protected crops. So, you know, glasshouse crops, it's not really much difference in interior crops, is it? No. Okay, that's great. Um, a question about the size of the rolls. Is the 12-inch roll more effective than the 6-inch roll? Yeah, so this just comes down to the crop type and the economics. The bigger the trapping area, the more thrips you catch, and it's just a straightforward, uh, yeah. Um, I, but I think per area of trap, you slightly get more thrips per area on the 12 inch roll and the 30 centimeter roll. So, yeah. And I guess your labor cost is the same whether you're putting out a 6 or 12 inch. So it's. It's probably better bang for your book to go for the slightly bigger one. Yeah, the, the more you put, the more you, more you catch. Yeah. yeah, yeah, bigger fishing net. Yeah, catches more fish. Great. Okay. Um, a comment on uh, just on the, the palatability of the strawberries to different trips, and could it be that some strawberry plants are nutritionally better for the trips, so their fecundity goes up? And this is the case with black vine weevil. So, for example, when grown on a U compared to other host plants. Yeah, it could be the nectar of pollen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're just a better food source. Um, and I think this might be our last question. Does it matter about the orientation of the traps, like the way aphids are attracted to the south-facing traps? Um, yeah, typically... Yeah, it's, it's, I did, yeah, I did do a lot of trials on this at one point and, and it makes a little bit of difference. So again, if you get the sun shining on it, you do tend to get a little bit more, but you typically will put them down the, the legs of the tunnels in a glass house. So they're all orientating in a certain direction anyway. But if you've got a board trap, you could put it south, north, south, it's catch slightly more, not huge. Okay. Yeah. Um... And the last, last, last question. So do sticky traps work on aphids in glasshouse crops? I think we've, we've a good idea of what that answer is. 
or are there other non-chemical controls for aphids in glasshouse crops? I suppose today isn't an aphid seminar, but we do know yellow sticky traps are, are pretty effective at monitoring and mass trapping as well. So depending on the species and location, it might be more or less effective. Um, but I think we may come back to that again some other day. Or Claire, would you like to comment on that? Because I know Russell IPM, we, we've talked about thrips today, but you would cover a lot of different pests, um, do, different pheromones and sticky traps as well, um, yeah. and have video connectivity with some of the, the trapping systems that you're using. So I suppose maybe you could expand on that a little bit if you like. Yeah, so again, yes, aphids are caught on the, the yellow traps, uh, not the blue. Um, and the other non-chemical controls, so again, you, the biocontrol um, companies so, so do offer a variety. There's quite a variety of predators and parasitoids for aphid control. And you have to get the right parasitoid for the right aphid species. So what people are tending to, because there's a range of aphid species in most of the crops, people are tending to release this parasitoid mix, which is five species, so it includes things like prey on and different aphidious species, in them, and I think aphelinus is in there. So that covers a, a wider range of, of aphids. But I think it, I'd have to say it's one of the pest groups that's the least well controlled biologically. We've got lace, lace wings as well, you know, and they're a predator, so they'll eat colonies of aphids. Well, I've done quite a lot of lace wing um, trials and they're, they're nocturnal, they're difficult to see. It's, it's less easy to see how good they are. I mean, the parasitoids are, are worth doing, but you still get these hot spots of aphids turning up. Um, there are some non-chemical aphid treatments, but you, you know, like physical control products. Um, Fargrove's got one, I'm just losing its, I've forgotten its name for them. Flipper, is it? Oh, yeah. 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 But again, it requires on really good contact and that's not always easy to get with these different crops. Strawberries, it's really hard to get good contact with spraying because you can't get under the leaves. So for strawberry, if you're going for biocontrol, you've got to put these parasitoids in very early and then you're st uh, very early season, you're up against the temperatures. So that's, it, it, aphid control is difficult. Um, and again, it's pr early preventative releases and then it can get quite expensive depending on what crop you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm being a bit negative there, <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully we've got new things up in the, hor in the horizon. I, what I think that the, the combination of five aphid uh, predators or, or parasites is is quite helpful that the, the grower doesn't need to be identifying all the species of aphids that are present, that if you're taking a, a scattered gun approach, that you've got a, a better likelihood of success. It, it's not going to be complete success, um, but it, it's starting you on the, the right foot, I think. Um, so it, it's not... Uh, yeah, there's good news in there too. And the lace wings, I think there are some lace wing products becoming available as well from, uh, from eggs, which is uh, an interesting approach as well to take and see how they, they perform in, in different environments. Um, Eamon, I, have you any last question there for Claire before you wrap up? No, I just think my experience over the last 20 years is with trips, prevention is better than cure. I think a lot of the people I deal with, they'd be very aware of trips now 20 years ago they weren't so much aware of it because it didn't seem to be a problem. But over those years, it's become a bigger, bigger, bigger issue. Um, when do we start seeing trips? Usually around the end of May, when people actually start cutting silage, it's kind of around that time that trip damage begins to appear. And then it just continues on throughout the summer. And it depends on the temperature. If it's a really cool year, it's not generally a big problem. And um, if you get a spike in temperature, you get explosions of populations. And then if you don't have prevention, if you don't have predators in, kind of all hell breaks loose then. It's very difficult to, to control the problem. So it's trapping, uh, monitoring, monitoring, and just getting those predators in early. That's, that's, that's the key. Like, yeah, that's my experience. So your talk is brilliant. We've, we've talked for 45 minutes and I, I've learned so much in those 40 minutes. It's brilliant. 
and I haven't let my, left my office. <laughs> Quite amazing. <laughs> Brilliant. Sorry about my daughter coming in in the middle. Oh, no worries. <laughs> no. Well, look, I am. Um, I, I would echo that from Eamon, you know, I've learned a huge amount. Um, it's been really, really interesting. And it's great to see, you know, non-chemical, non-standard chemical approaches that can be highly effective. They mightn't be the full answer, but they're getting, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a long way down the road. So it is a really um, positive, I, I suppose, space to be in that's developed over the last couple of years. Uh, Claire, I want to say a big thank you from myself and Eamon in Chagas and from all the, the attendees. We've had 46 people tuned in the whole time. We haven't lost anyone along the way, so that's really great. Um, and some messages of thanks coming in there in the, the chat room as well. So Claire, thanks a million. Your products, the Russell IPM products are available in Ireland through some of the, the main dealers. I know I think NAD are yeah. one of the suppliers, but there's, there's probably others as well. Um, I think it's NAD is, is our main supplier, yeah. Yeah. In very good. Thanks very much. Thanks. Your your I'm contact nice details you. are there. Oh, you're, you're, no, we're delighted to have you again, and hopefully you'll be able to get come and visit Ireland in the near future. Um, it'll be safe to come and visit soon. I hope so. That would be wonderful. <laughs> Great. Thanks a million. Just for the, the others who are tuning in, we've got a couple more events on in the next few weeks. On April the 7th, um, we'll be looking at AFID control with the IPM options. Um, that's David Davidson in Coppers. Uh, the following week, Eamon, you've got a Berry event on on the 13th. Um, Stuart Mills in Fargo, looking at a whole range of IPM options for soft fruit. Yeah. That's right. And then on the 15th of April, we've got a wee control with um, uh, David Talbot in ADAS in the UK and looking at nursery stock um, field and container production wee control. So some, some great information coming up there. So with that, I'll say thanks very much to Eamon and especially to Claire for the work that you've put in and the time you've given us this morning and sharing some um, really great information. I have, can I wish you all a, a happy and successful Easter? And um, yeah, uh, hopefully we'll see you again in a short while. So thanks to everyone. Bye. Thanks a million. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.